Now, this is a topic I have some personal passion for, because back in the day, I used to not play games through emulation. I would only play old games through official means, unlike the Nintendo Virtual Console or whatever other thing was available at the time. And I was perfectly content with that at the time, but eventually I did start to look into game emulation a little bit. And when I started playing games on emulation, I started to realize that, oh my god, I've been doing it wrong this entire time, because oftentimes the official way to play old games is so bad, and when you go to unofficial emulation, you see all of the incredible things you can do with old games. And nowadays, I play tons of old games through emulation. It's very rare that I load something up on some official re-release or go back to the original consoles, because there's really just no reason to. Oftentimes, emulation is just the objectively better way to play old games, and I love it for that. And that's why I'm making this video, because I want to help others realize the same thing I did years ago. Because something that oftentimes irks me is when I see someone playing some classic game on, like, Nintendo Switch Online or something like that, and I just go, ugh, you shouldn't be playing that version of the game, bro. There is a much, much better version of the game available. And that's not to criticize the people that play these versions of these games. You know, a lot of times they just don't even know about what's available. My criticism here is for the companies that put out these very mediocre re-releases of classic games and have people playing and oftentimes paying for inferior versions of games that are already available in a superior form elsewhere. And I know there are many people out there who don't have the capability to emulate games, you know, they don't have PCs or whatever, but there are a lot of people out there that are perfectly capable of emulating games, they just don't do it, either because they don't know about what's available, or maybe they don't want to for some weird reason? And to me, that's just a shame, because you're robbing yourself of a much better experience revisiting that classic game, or whatever. So join me on a little trip as I show you all of the amazing things available when playing games through emulation. However, before we get into that, I first want to address reasons that people often don't play games through emulation, and I want to talk about those things a little bit. The first big one would be the legality of playing games through emulation. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to play games through emulation because it's illegal or whatever. But that is false. You have been fed lies by gaming companies. There is absolutely nothing illegal about emulating games. Pirating games is what is illegal, but playing a game on an emulator is perfectly A-OK. -okay. Now, of course, many times when people play games through emulation, it's through pirated copies of games that they download online, and that certainly is illegal, but it doesn't have to be that way. It is very possible to take your own legit copy of a game and get the files onto your computer and then play it through emulation. Problem there is that oftentimes it can be a very complicated and time-consuming process in order to do that, so I totally understand people not wanting to jump through all those hoops in order to be able to do that. But that is when we get into the morality of downloading games, because as we all know, no one's really gonna come after you if you download a fucking NES game and start playing it on your computer. But no doubt that is most definitely stealing, and even if you're not gonna get in trouble for that, maybe you don't want to do that kind of thing. But I think that there are ways that you can do it and still be in the clear as far as the ethics of game emulation is concerned. For example, if you already have a legit copy of the game, then I'd argue it's not pirating if you download it, because nothing stops you from going through the hassle of getting your own files onto your computer, and then it is functionally identical to as if you had downloaded the game online. You have your legit physical copy, and then a digital version of that same game on your computer. The only difference is where those files are coming from. Which, as far as I'm concerned, is really just a way for you to save yourself a bunch of time and a giant headache. Which, by the way, this is not legal advice, this is just my opinion on these kinds of things. Another big factor is what about games that you can't get anymore? What about games that are no longer available and are no longer for sale and haven't been put up on a digital storefront? What are you supposed to do there? I mean, you could hunt down an old physical copy of a game and then technically you have it, but... That doesn't actually benefit the company that owns the rights to that game whatsoever, so it's not like you're harming them by just downloading the game even if you don't have a copy. 
the only person you're technically harming there would be the seller on eBay or whatever, but even then, there are also extreme cases out there, like if you're gonna play a game that is super duper rare and valuable, like this game right here, Ninja 5.0. This is a cool little GBA ninja action platformer, and it's really, really fun. Do me a favor and go look up how much a copy of Ninja 5.0 is on eBay, and yeah, it's fucking ridiculous. You have to, like, sell your spleen to be able to get a copy of this game. So in this case, not only is the company that owns this game not getting any money, but not even the used reseller is getting money because I'm not buying this game under any circumstances, which means no one gets any money and I don't get to play the game. The only difference here is no one gets any money and I do get to play the game. No one is being harmed in this case, so I would say that's perfectly fine. Again, not legal advice. Also, another thing to consider is what about games that are completely unavailable now, such as digital-only games that have been removed from their storefronts, or the storefront itself has been shut down. There's just no way to get these games whatsoever anymore at all, so you're not harming anyone by grabbing these. Another reason I often hear of why people don't like to emulate games is because of emulation quality, how emulators sometimes can fail to 100% accurately emulate the console and thus games don't exactly work the way that they're supposed to. And that can definitely be a thing sometimes, but I feel like people that are concerned about this maybe had like a bad experience with an emulator way back in the day. Because these days, there are a lot of really good, really accurate emulators out there that can run most games on their libraries totally fine. You just gotta make sure you're using the right emulators, which of course that could require some research about which are the good emulators, which are the bad ones. Oh god, it's a giant headache. But don't worry, I've already gone through that headache for you and I'm gonna have some recommendations at the end of the video. Now, granted, on some emulators, even the really, really good ones, there are gonna be some games that do have some problems, but oftentimes I feel that is very much worth putting up with for all of the extra enhancements that you get through playing games on emulation, which we'll get to later. Another big reason I think a lot of people don't get into emulation of games is because it requires a little bit of PC gaming techie know-how. And that is definitely a thing. Sometimes emulating games and really just PC gaming in general can be a fucking nightmare and can require all this troubleshooting and, oh god, what's going wrong? I don't understand. Something is broken and it wasn't broken yesterday. What the fuck? Nothing changed. Oh god. And you have to go configuring all your settings again and try to figure out what the problem is. Oh, Jesus fucking Christ. But really, that's just PC gaming. If you're an experienced PC gamer, you're very familiar with those kinds of things. And while that can sound scary, generally, a lot of times, the really popular, really good emulators these days are very easy to use, and you're not gonna run into issues that often most of the time. And if you do, there's usually some resources out there to help you out with your problems. So that definitely can be an issue and it can get annoying, but I would argue that it's worth it to put up with for the end result. But I could definitely understand someone not really wanting to put up with all that stuff. And the last reason I often see of why people don't like to play games on emulation is they prefer the authenticity of playing games on original hardware. You know, they don't even like to play games on, like, modern official re-releases. They go back to the original console, sometimes even playing on an actual old CRT and doing that whole thing. And to that, I really have no argument. You know, if you just like that kind of old-school way of playing games, you know, you do you, man. I can't really say you're wrong for enjoying that kind of thing. Do whatever you want. But what I will say is that oftentimes the original experience for a game is not the best. There were problems back in the day, and you can fix a lot of those problems now and get a better experience with an old game than the original one on the original hardware. Plus, I often see people that play on official hardware spending like hundreds of dollars to get like an upscale converter so that way you could play like the N64 on a modern TV just to get a good picture out of it and all this stuff. And I'm like, bro, this is so much easier and so much cheaper if you just play through emulation. Like, I don't get the appeal. So now, I want to start talking about playing games through emulation and all of the great benefits that can come from that. And the first thing I want to touch on is RetroArch, which if you're not familiar, RetroArch is a kind of multi-emulator front end that is really, really intuitive and user-friendly, and it's a great way to play lots of different emulators all in one place, consolidated into a single easy-to-use system. 
RetroArch has a bunch of cores, which are various different emulators that you can download, and then they're installed on the RetroArch, and then you can load up any game through that emulator that it supports. And then what's great about RetroArch is that it unifies all of the different settings and features and customization options available in various emulators to the singular RetroArch UI, so it all works exactly how you would expect it to. Plus, RetroArch has the ability to add additional features universally across all of its emulators that maybe that emulator itself doesn't support natively. So it's a great way to enhance many emulators and get even better results out of what you're trying to play. Not to mention the fact that it makes playing lots of emulators really, really easy and straightforward. You can even get really fancy with RetroArch and give it some really nice front ends that are even more intuitive and user-friendly if that's what you want to do. Personally, I'm fine with just the default plain RetroArch the way it is. So if you've not done emulation before, I highly recommend just get RetroArch. It's a really good starting place. It's even on Steam, though the Steam version of it is much more limited than the standalone version, so I'd recommend just getting the standalone version. I'll have a link to that, as well as many, many other things that I'm going to mention throughout the video in the description. Now with that out of the way, let's start talking about the real benefits that can come from playing games through emulation, starting at the beginning, or at least the beginning as far as anyone actually cares with the NES. A lot of NES emulators have a nice feature where you can fix the flickering that happens on NES when there are too many sprites loaded into the game because the NES couldn't properly render that many objects at once. Through emulation, you can fix that issue, which is very nice. But way more significant than that is you can fix the slowdown. This is actually something you can do on a number of different emulators for many different consoles, not just improving their frame rates, but also making them more stable, stopping frame drops, and in other cases, also fixing slowdown so you don't have to deal with that anymore, which is great. But by far the coolest thing you can do with NES emulation is texture loads, where you can completely reskin a game with higher resolution textures. For example, I'm playing Mega Man 1 right here, and this is not a port of it on a different system or a remake or anything. This is the NES version of Mega Man 1, but it has a texture pack running that overlays on top of the original sprites to make the game look way nicer than originally did. And this is something that I could definitely see people taking or leaving. Maybe you prefer the old school sprites, and that's totally fine. I would agree in many cases, actually. But it's certainly a cool thing, you can't deny that, the fact that this is even possible. You can even swap out the music for some games to have higher quality versions of it. Pretty cool feature, I would say. And this is the kind of thing where this is not available for every NES emulator, so you gotta make sure you're using the right one, which again, I'll have recommendations at the end. Now, moving on to SNES, and this is something you can also do with the Sega Genesis, this is a feature that's definitely in its infancy with these systems, but there are a couple of games you can do it for. Some emulators for these systems have started to enable playing games in widescreen in 16x9, which is really, really cool. Now, oftentimes, a lot of games don't work if you just try to run it in 16x9 because they're not programmed that way, so oftentimes they'll need some sort of patch or ROM hack in order to work. But some games, like Shinobi 3 here, just work when you run them in widescreen, which is really, really cool. Now, for Game Boy, this is a very specific thing, and it really pisses me off anytime Nintendo re-releases Game Boy games officially, because oftentimes they have no options for colors. Normally, they'll just have the game available in black and white, or for Nintendo Switch Online, they had, like, very basic color palette stuff that you can do. But there's a lot of color stuff that's available for old Game Boy games if you're running them on the right hardware. For example, Kirby's Dream Land 2 had Super Game Boy support, so you could play the game in a much more colorful form. And this is something that you cannot do through any official version of Kirby's Dream Land 2 that has ever been re-released. And that's really fucking stupid, because if you just ran the game in Super Game Boy mode, then you would get a better experience. And through certain Game Boy emulators, you can do that, and you can get those extra benefits. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about when people play through official means. It's like fucking Nintendo will not put in the work to actually provide a satisfactory version of these old games, and it fucking pisses me off. Uh, for Game Gear, there's one cool thing in particular that you can do, which is that the Game Gear and the Master System are basically the exact same console, but with some slight modifications to them. And they're actually so similar that certain Game Gear emulators can run Game Gear games at Master System resolution, massively increasing the screen space and letting you see way more in things like platformers. In fact, some Game Gear games were originally Master System games, and when they were ported to Game Gear, they didn't, like, rescale the sprites or anything, so you just can't see enough to play the game properly. 
but something like this can enable you to fix that if you're not just going to play the Master System version of certain games. But it's worth mentioning this doesn't work with every single game. Some games are just broken if you try to do it, but for the games that it does work, it's a very cool little feature. Now, moving into the realm of 3D emulators, many of them have the same three big improvements that are possible, which is that one, you can run the game at pretty much any resolution. Many old games that could only run in 4x3 can be forced to run in widescreen. And of course, many old games due to the limitations at the time only ran at 30 FPS or sometimes below, and oftentimes you can force those games to now run at higher frame rates, which is wonderful. Those three benefits alone are huge to me and are automatically going to make me go towards emulation whenever I'm going to try to play an old school 3D game. But then on top of that, many 3D emulators also have other nice enhancements and features that they can implement. For example, on the PS1, that console was not able to properly render textures in 3D, which is why you would get that texture warble on PS1 games whenever the camera was moving. But with certain PS1 emulators, you can fix that problem and get properly rendered 3D, which I really like a lot. This is something I could see some people not liking because the texture wiggling of PS1 games is kind of iconic to that console, but that's also one of the benefits of emulation. You can run the games however you would like. You can fix the problem if you want, or you can leave it the way it was. It's all about having the options and being able to play the game however you would like. Now for PS2, here's going to be one that some people probably aren't going to care about that much or might not even notice, but PS2 games often ran in interlace. They did not run in progressive scan. But many people online have created fixes for a lot of PS2 games to force them to run in progressive scan to make the games look way sharper and way better, which is fantastic. Moving on to the Wii, the biggest benefit for Wii emulation is the ability to remove motion controls if you want. If you want, you can play emulated Wii games on PC with a Wii remote and nunchuck just like you would the original games with a sensor bar and everything. But a lot of Wii games didn't really take advantage of motion controls in a meaningful way and oftentimes waggling was just like a replacement for a button press and it's just annoying and stupid. And through button remapping, you can assign motion inputs to button presses and thus allow you to play motion required games with just a traditional controller, which is very nice. It's not going to work for every Wii game out there. There are a number of them that you're going to have to play with a Wii remote and nunchuck, but for the ones where you can, it's a very nice benefit. Also, for some games that are entirely pointer dependent, you can just apply that to your mouse and play it like a normal PC game, which is very cool and oftentimes will increase your accuracy. And when it comes to emulating DS and 3DS games, a nice thing you can do is you can customize the layout of the screens because a lot of these dual screen games don't really take advantage of both screens in a very significant way. And so you don't really need the two screens taking up equal space since you can make one screen the main screen and then have a smaller secondary screen, which is really good. And for games where you do want to have one screen on top of the other, if you have a monitor that can turn into portrait mode, that is a great way to play these games. Another big benefit that a lot of emulators have is support for online play, because, you know, a lot of old games did not have anything like that. But through emulation, you can play a lot of games online. In particular, I really want to highlight Fightcade, because this is an arcade emulator specifically designed for playing fighting games online, and it has fantastic rollback netcode, and it is like the place to go if you want to play classic arcade fighting games online with other people. In fact, Fightcade is so good that pretty much every official way to play these games online is just dead, because everyone's just like, go to Fightcade, just play there, it's the way to do it. And those are a lot of the, like, emulator-specific benefits you can get for playing games on this console versus that console. But there's also a lot of just universally really nice features that you get playing any emulated game. For example, you can use any controller you want for any console you want. Because let's be honest, a lot of old controllers were not very good. They had very questionable design a lot of times, or they were very cheaply made with very shitty parts and stuff like that. Plus, you need to develop like 15 different sets of muscle memory for all these different controllers that you're switching back and forth between if you switch consoles a bunch. Whereas me personally, playing all these different consoles through emulation, I just use a modern Xbox controller for everything, and it's wonderful. In fact, if you have a controller with a gyroscope built into it, then you can even emulate motion input. Plus, there's also the option to remap button controls, because a lot of old games didn't really have the option to customize your controls and could sometimes have really weird, funky layouts where you're like, what the fuck? Or they'll have it so that you can't invert the camera and you're just stuck with that. But through emulation, you can just change your inputs and you can do whatever the fuck you want. Fuck you, game. I can invert the x-axis so looking left looks fucking left. 
Of course, the one thing everybody knows about emulation is save states, which, yeah, you can use them to cheat at games if you want, but save states can also be used as really great time savers. Like, if you're playing something to try to practice speedrunning or whatever, then it can be a really good way to just have instant one-button restarts when that's not normally available in a lot of old games. You can just, oh, made a mistake, right back to the beginning immediately, and you're playing again without having to go through loading screens and this and that and repicking your character and repicking the level and all that kind of shit that you have to put up with games that just wastes a bunch of time. Another great thing about playing games through emulation is the ability to download save files if you want. Because picture yourself in this situation. You're having some buddies come over and you're all going to have a great time playing some Shrek Super Slam, as many people often do. But then your friends get over and you load up the game and oh no, you don't have all the characters and all the stages unlocked. Well, that sucks. And normally, the only way to unlock all this stuff would be through playing hours and hours of single-player content. And you don't want to do that, you just want to play some matches with your buddies, you just want to have everything. Playing normally, you don't really have many options other than just to do it, or maybe copy a save file from a friend if they have it or whatever. But through playing emulation, it's super duper easy to just download a completed save file, put it in the right folder, and boom, now you have everything. And that's a lot of the benefits that just come from playing games on emulation standalone, but there's a lot of other things that you can also do with emulated games that you can technically do playing games on official hardware, but it's much more complicated and much more time consuming and much more difficult to do. For example, playing ROM hacks and mods. Yes, it is possible to play these things on official hardware, but it's way, way easier to just take your game file on PC, patch it, and then load it up on your emulator. And there is a lot of really cool stuff out there, be it enhanced versions of old games or total conversion things where you take a game and you turn it into something completely different. You can fix various issues that certain games had or enhance them in ways that were completely impossible on the original hardware, like playing the Metroid Prime trilogy with keyboard and mouse or traditional twin stick controller support. You can take certain Game Boy games and turn them into Game Boy Color games. Now that is really fucking cool. Not to mention there are like retranslation mods out there. So if a game has a bad localization, you can get something more authentic to the original. Or there are a lot of games that just never got localized. And then they do have fan translations available, letting you play a game you wouldn't have been able to play otherwise. Plus, there are a lot of like old Japanese games that did not have dual audio available when they got localized. So you just have to deal with the English. And if it's a bad dub or you just prefer it in the original language, then you're just stuck with that. A lot of those have undubs available, letting you get the original audio but keep the translation, which is great. Plus, of course, there's like decensoring things where certain things get changed for different regions, and if you want the original version, then you can usually get some sort of mod or hack that will restore a lot of the cut elements from the game. Also, there's one thing in particular I think is very worth mentioning, which is Melee being able to be played with Slippy to have online play with rollback, and it's got all these cool features and stuff. Like, that is really, really great. This is the problem with playing old games through official re-releases, is because they have budgets and deadlines, they're never going to be able to put that much stuff into these old games. So oftentimes we get very bare-bones re-releases of things, oftentimes with bad emulation and lots of issues like that. And it could just never compete with what the community is able to do with a game, with all their free time and tons of people all contributing to this stuff over years. It's just way too good. So good that I struggle to pretty much ever recommend playing an old game through official means. Now, I mentioned earlier in the video that sometimes emulation can be a giant pain in the ass, which it definitely can be, and there's a lot of stuff to learn and a lot of groundwork and a lot of, oh god, what's happening? I don't know, I have to do a bunch of research and shit. And that does suck hard, let me tell ya. But as someone that has already gone through all that and done all the groundwork and gone through all that frustration and annoyance, let me save you some time. Let me give you some pro tips for emulating games to make your experience much smoother and much better and save you a giant headache. First things first, I highly recommend not just for emulation, but also if you're doing PC gaming in general, I recommend downloading the program Joytiki. It's a really, really good program that allows you to map keyboard and mouse controls to a controller which is good for just generally PC gaming if games don't have proper controller support, but it's also good for emulators because it lets you set like hotkeys to certain buttons on a controller for like quickly loading and saving states and stuff like that. Plus it can also enable you to do certain things in certain emulators that aren't really possible normally just using the emulator's input system, so definitely a program that you want to get. 
Another thing worth mentioning is that some emulators do also require a BIOS from the original console in order to run, such as, for example, PCSX2 requires a PS2 BIOS, so you're gonna need to get a PS2 BIOS somewhere, which, similar for games, I'd recommend if you want to be in the moral clear on that, you should also have the console, so that way you have a legit copy of the BIOS. And here's a really, really big important one that I recommend. If you're going to be playing anything from some of the later Gen 3D consoles, like a GameCube or PS2 game or something like that or later, usually the emulators for these games will have a wiki, and I highly, highly, highly recommend going to the wiki page for that game before you emulate it, because oftentimes these pages will have lists of problems the game may have, and you have to set the settings to these specific things in order to fix those problems, and they'll oftentimes have codes and hacks available for higher frame rates or widescreen, and they'll also sometimes even have texture packs available for running the game at higher resolutions. And that's actually another tip in general, is to make sure you go into the emulator settings and configure things to your liking. A lot of emulators can have lots of different features that you might not know exactly what they do, and if you don't know what it is, don't fuck with it, just leave it how it is. But, you know, there are certain things like resolution and stuff like that that you can obviously fuck around with and try to experiment and see what you can get to look pretty good. And for a specific tip, if you're going to play on PPSSPP, then I recommend turning this setting off, because this setting can introduce quite a bit of input lag to certain games, which is obviously no good. Another really, really big tip that a lot of people are not aware of when they play old sprite-based games is to make sure that your resolution and aspect ratio is set correctly. Because goddammit, is it the worst thing in the world when you see someone playing an old game and it's stretched out to full screen and it looks fucking terrible? Don't ever do that. These games were not meant to run in widescreen unless you have some kind of patch or hack or something like that. But also, you don't necessarily always want to run these old games in 4x3, because the thing about a lot of old consoles is that they didn't actually render a 4x3 image. They would oftentimes render an image narrower than that, and then they would stretch that image out on the CRT display to 4x3. And over time, a lot of games started to account for this stretch when they were illustrating the artwork so it would look correct. But some games were not designed that way, and some games, they're actually not meant to be stretched out like that. For examples of what I mean, if you look at Sonic the Hedgehog, this is an example of a game that was designed with the 4x3 stretch in mind. The easiest way to tell this is to look in the game for anything that's supposed to be a perfect square or perfect circle, and just look at it and ask yourself, is that a perfect square or perfect circle? You can see when Sonic rolls in a ball, yeah, he's a circle, that's perfectly correct. If you instead run the game in its native resolution with one by one square pixels, then now everything looks squished and it doesn't look correct. So Sonic is an example of a game that you want stretched out to 4x3. But then if we look at another game, you can see that when you run it in 4x3, you can see all the square tiles and they don't look right. They're not squares, they're rectangles. But then when you run the game at its native resolution, then there you go. Now they're proper squares. So this is how the game was supposed to look. That's a really big one that oftentimes a lot of people miss and don't even know about, so I hope I was able to help you out with that one. And actually, on the topic of making a game look the way it was supposed to, another thing about a lot of old games is that they actually were designed with the artifacts that came from poor video signal quality. They actually made the game with those artifacts in mind, and they would actually use that to achieve certain visual effects. And if you want to get that true, authentic experience, then you have to either play the game on an actual CRT using, like, composite video, or certain emulators can allow you to have some filters on it. Like RetroArch, you can put that on pretty much any game you want, and you can have a CRT composite filter look. Obviously, it's not exactly the same as playing on a CRT, but it's a pretty close approximation, and a lot of times those effects can be properly emulated. As an example, take a look at this waterfall right here and how it's transparent. Thing about the Genesis, though, is that it could not do transparencies, so how is this doing this? Well, that's because of the composite video artifacts creating this effect. Because if we go to the raw output of the game, then you see what's really going on here. The blurring of the colors from the composite video creates the illusion of transparency, and that is something you miss when you just look at the raw pixels from the game's output on a modern display. 
There are, of course, some pretty ugly artifacts that can come from these kinds of things, like how everything looks all blurry and how you do get some sort of, like, color bleed on everything that's not supposed to be there and there's just no way around that. It's really just a preference thing of how you prefer the game to look. Do you want the original, authentic look that it was designed for with all the artifacts and stuff that can be used for nice effects? Or do you prefer a more pixely, sharp look? Which, personally, I am more a fan of the modern pixelated look. I really, really don't like the blurry look of this kind of thing because it looks like I'm looking at something that's supposed to be really high detail, but I'm looking at it and it's like blurry and I'm looking at it through like a screen. And as someone who has glasses, I cannot fucking stand looking at something when it's all blurry and I can't see detail. That annoys the fuck out of me. I much prefer my razor sharp pixels, but again, that's just a preference thing. That's the great thing about emulation. Do whatever you want. However, we also have to talk about the dark side of what you can do with sprite-based games in emulation, because I would say you either go for, like, the old CRT look or the really sharp square pixel look. But some emulators also enable some filters to be used that I think look fucking horrible. Like, if you just put some basic filtering on a game, then you just take a really sharp, beautiful-looking pixel game, and it just gets all blurry, and this is like the worst of both worlds. You don't get the sharpness from the pixel look, but you also don't get any of the important visual effects from the CRT look, so it just looks awful. And then there's also the other type of pixel filter where it tries to take all the square pixels and like smooth them out and turn them into lines and it results in this like really weird look to games where it kind of looks like it's almost like drawn but it's very strange because of how it's trying to take square pixels and turn it into smoother things and I don't know I see people playing games on emulators with this kind of look sometimes and I don't know how people are okay with this. I think it looks really terrible. But again, I guess do whatever you want. It's up to you. But uh, I don't get it. Also, in this same vein, the PS1 would often apply a dithering effect to games, which sometimes looks really good, but other times looks really bad and is clearly not supposed to be there. But the PS1 just uniformly applied it to everything. So for some games, you might want to turn it on, and for some games, you might want to turn it off. Generally, for like pixel sprite-based games, you want the dithering turned off, but for certain 3D games, it does benefit from the dithering. So again, that's a thing you just have to experiment with and see what works. Uh, so there you go. There's all my pro tips for emulating games. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. I hope that this has educated you about all the wonderful benefits that come from playing games through emulation. And if you want to get into emulation and you don't know where to start, as I said, RetroArch is a very, very good starting place. And here's a list of all the cores that I personally use for RetroArch. These are generally the best emulators I could find for all of these consoles. But there are also a number of emulators that aren't available on RetroArch or work better when you just get the emulator independently by itself. So in addition to all these, I recommend that you get Dolphin for GameCube and Wii games, Citra for 3DS games, PPSSPP for PSP, say that five times fast, PCSX2 for PS2, Project 64 for N64 games, CXBX Reloaded for the original Xbox, Xenia for Xbox 360, RPCS3 is there for PS3 emulation, but that emulator is still pretty early on, so it doesn't run very many games super well yet, but it's making progress. It'll get there one day. Seamu for Wii U games, primarily for Breath of the Wild, of course. And as I already said, Fightcade if you want to play a bunch of arcade fighting games. Again, I'll have links in the description to emulators and all the various things I recommend you use for all this stuff, so uh, have at it. Go have yourself a good time emulating some games. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. I'll see you next time.